I spend my nights in the wastelands of Fallout, The Last of Us and Borderlands. I keep an eye on US politics and I'm a fan of Alex Garland. So this movie was made for me. So how did I end up torn between the lovers and the haters? Well, I love the concept and the visuals, but I hate the story and its execution. What the hell happened to the genius writer of The Beach, 28 Days Later and Ex Machina? Nobody at A24 cares about what I'm saying here. Civil War was made on their biggest budget ever, $50 million, and it's doubled that at the box office. In Hollywood, that doesn't necessarily mean profitable, but they're likely in the black by now. Oh, and spoilers. I read The Beach soon after it came out in the late 1990s and I thought it was terrific and Danny Boyle's adaptation did a great job. Garland's follow-up 28 Days Later is a genre classic and his first directing gig Ex Machina is in my top five sci-fi movies of this millennium. As soon as the Ex Machina profits allowed him to do so, Alex Garland directed his very own version of 28 Days Later mixed with a dose of Apocalypse Now. Annihilation. In that movie, Natalie Portman's character and her military crew cross the tropical jungle of the Shimmer in an existential mission to confront and be consumed by her dark alter ego, sort of an alien Colonel Kurtz, if you wish. A24 pretended Garland never made a movie called Men and pre-sold Civil War internationally for a juicy sum. So it only needed a modest amount at the domestic box office to break even. Okay. Now Garland, being the real deal he is, gave his own Apocalypse Now a third shot and this time we embark on an odyssey across the American wasteland to shoot yet another version of Colonel Kurtz as he awaits his fate in the White House, complete with his own private militia. Civil War still echoes Apocalypse Now and 28 Days Later, but it's more of a children of men and as a fan of The Last of Us, it was hard not to see Joel and Ellie when looking at Joel and Jesse. And another connection with that IP is of course Nick Offerman. On the other hand, Jefferson White was plucked from the Taylor Sheridan universe and when we're in the car with Jesse looking at corpses dangling from an overpass, that shot came straight out of Sicario. Now, while I prefer Sheridan and Mason for their handling of politics, I did like Civil War for its concept and protagonists, a crew of war photographers on their way to the photo frame of a lifetime. The two leads work for Reuters, one of the world's few reliable news sources, unlike YouTube. Photojournalists have a bad habit of dying on the job or at least breaking a leg, so it comes with just the right amount of stakes for a large audience. But Civil War never rises to the level of any of the classic road trips, war movies or even movies about journalists. To quote Gotham Calling, A24 productions have such a serious, pretentious tone that they keep hinting towards something sophisticated and meaningful without living up to that promise." Unquote. Now you're not on this channel for a movie review, so let's talk storycraft. And here's my core claim. It's unlikely that you're going to break in with this type of screenplay. Before going into specifics, let's get one thing straight. I'm not saying Garland should have done anything differently. From his perspective, he can and should push the boundaries in different ways than you and I. I am saying though, newcomers can learn more by studying the work of Craig Mazin and Taylor Sheridan and Michael Arndt, Meglafov, James Cameron, just fill in your favorites here. Now, as an aspiring screenwriter, what precisely should you be cautious about in Civil War? First of all, Act 2 starts too early. Our team is in the van, heading for DC, only 15 minutes into the film. Sure, every act should be as short as possible, but the first act has a job to do, like making us care. Blade Runner had a similar issue with its 8 minute first act. Read about it here. If you felt you didn't relate to the photographers by the time they hopped into the van, here's the reason. For an ensemble of four with two competing leads, it takes time to set them up in a way that we feel we know them and we care about them or even understand what the heck they want. 15 minutes doesn't cut it. A side effect is that the second act feels very long. Length is not a problem in itself, but it's just harder to keep the same goal interesting for that long. Now, about that goal. They want to get to the president in time, but it never feels like they're not gonna make it. They're not in a rush as they take all the time in the world for long conversations, which is another flaw in itself. Half of the movie alternates suspense and action with talking heads. Instead of solving the long act issue, this makes the pacing worse. Long static dialogue kills momentum. By the way, pacing was the number one issue a former Netflix reader flagged here on the channel as a priority to focus on. Alex, perhaps give that a watch. But I get it. 
Civil War's budget was only $50 million. It means that you cannot have non-stop spectacle. Plus, it's an ideas movie and dialogue is the main vehicle here. But you know what would have helped? Conflict. Most of the dialogue in Act 2 feels like campfire talk. Also, please never show your characters going to sleep. Sure, it's realistic, but it's a way of signaling a lack of urgency. Now, here's my major gripe. Our characters stray from their goal the whole time. Why are they suddenly photographing a standoff between the warring parties if time is of the essence? And why make two lengthy overnight stops between New York and DC? It pulls the rug from under any sense of urgency. If the characters are not fighting to achieve their goal, it sucks the energy out of a film. Guess what the crew are doing halfway through this film? They go shopping. You get that right. Garland is trying to make the point that there is a sense of normalcy in some parts of the country. But normalcy is not what we need halfway through a movie. We need to shake things up majorly. This is why God created the midpoint reversal. I've demonstrated the power of the NPR many times on this channel. Soon after the shopping, we have the sniper scene. And as suspenseful as it may be, it's a distraction still. It doesn't change anything for our characters. If we were to cut it out, you wouldn't have missed a thing. So finally, we meet Jesse Plemons and his gang, where the film dutifully delivers the lowest point and the archetypal death of the mentor, thus closing the act. Really? After shunning common screenwriting sense for about 45 minutes, suddenly things become sort of hyper-formulaic, textbook hero's journey? If it sounds like I didn't enjoy the movie, I actually did. Third act pulls it all together with some great visuals and a generous dose of melodrama. I also appreciate Garland's efforts in balancing the tone, although not everybody agrees with me on that one. So bottom line, I really believe that a ton more people could have enjoyed Civil War with a robust structure and a tighter script, and at least a proper NPR. It would have given the film a better pacing, stronger word of mouth, and perhaps even a larger female audience. Garland is no James Cameron, but he's just as good a director as he is a writer. His writing process may be a little hazy, even a little lazy, but he still has a truckload of talent. To create an event movie that turns a profit is no mean feat. And I'm still keen to see anything Garland writes or directs, should he choose to do so. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe. There are a ton of videos on this channel that will help you improve your understanding of story dynamics and screenplays. And if you're about to write your own draft or send your script to a producer or a contest, do yourself a favor, boost your style skills with our advanced writing training. Check the links below this video. You'll give yourself a better chance and you're supporting us. Happy watching, happy writing. Cheers.